Good afternoon. Welcome to the Florida edition of our state webinar series, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some logistics. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow at the top of that panel allows the panel to shrink and reopen. You'll see a questions section of that control panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel, allowing you to type in any questions or comments. We will um, save time for questions both in the middle of the presentation and at the end. We are recording this webinar and we'll send the link to everybody who has registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I am Chris Coffin, American Farmland Trust's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me is Billy Van Pelt. Billy is AFT's Senior Director of External Relations and is based in Kentucky. Billy is focused on the expansion of AFT's national initiatives across the Southeast. For those of you not familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a very quick introduction. We are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress. We are an agricultural land trust, but we also focus on promoting sound farming practices through soil health and water quality initiatives. We also recognize that it's not farmland without farmers. So we focus on tools and strategies that facilitate land access for next generation producers and assist with farm transfer and succession for retiring farmers and farmland owners. Our programming and research informs our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, DC. So let me now turn it over to Billy. Thanks, Chris. We are delighted to be joined today by a number of valued partners, including the Florida Department of Agriculture, the Florida Forest Service, the University of Florida and University of Florida Extension, the Partnership for Gulf Coast Land Conservation, the Conserva Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast, the Nature Conservancy, Horse Farms Forever, and USDA NRCS representatives from both Florida and Puerto Rico. Thank you all for joining us today. We'd like to recognize and thank NRCS, especially for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. Thanks, Billy. So now we're going to talk about the findings from the Farms Under Threat report. Today we're focusing on the State of the States, which is the second in this research series. State of the States paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps each state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. We used a multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. For those of us who were not, for those of you who were not able to join us for our launch event, let me touch very quickly on the national findings. We studied a period from 2001 to 2016, a period of historically low housing starts. In this period, the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. 
that's the equivalent to all the land planted in the United States to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized just how big of a threat it is. And lastly, you see that more than a third of the land converted, about four and a half million acres, was what we have identified as nationally significant land, land best suited for intensive food and crop production. As you can see from this next map or next graphic, um, Florida is in our top 12 most threatened states based on the conversion numbers. Agricultural land conversion is a growing problem across the U.S. and especially, as you can see, throughout the South. Cities are sprawling and the proliferation of farmettes and ranchettes on their outskirts has created hot spots of conversion in virtually every state. So now we're gonna dive into the data specific to Florida and we're gonna use our new interactive website that has been built for this purpose. And we're gonna be ably assisted today in our cruise through the websites by our colleague and navigator, Beth Fraser. So thank you, Beth. Let's start with the reports and data tab over here on this welcome page. This is where you'll find the fact sheets that describe much of the methodology. So the methodology around the spatial analysis, some of it around the scorecard and a bunch of different appendices. If you are interested in getting access to the spatial data we used, we are going to be making that available. You would find a form by going to this link where Beth has the cursor, the geospatial data layers. If you fill that form out, we will be back in touch with more information about what and when this information will be made available. So now let's go to the drop down menu and choose Florida. When you do that, you will see that we come to both the spatial side and the policy side, and we're gonna start with the spatial data. And before we actually dig into the map, we're gonna show you this downloadable um, PDF. So it says download the conversion summary. And we created these two page PDFs as a way for stakeholders to have most of the most relevant information at their fingertips. This is a, a downloadable document that can be used for um, putting on a website or using it with conversations with um, policymakers or with journalists. Um, there are many uses. We hope you will find it helpful. And we felt that particularly with everybody's people with limited bandwidth that being able to have just a two pager that they can download would be useful. So uh, there's also a policy equivalent. Um, we're not going to show that, but we'll show where it is on the policy scorecard page. So now we're gonna look at the four categories of spatial data we created, starting with land cover and use. Here we used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the US. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of current land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low density residential development. It also includes a first ever attempt to spatially identify woodland associated with a ranch or a farm. Our mapping shows 8.4 million acres of agricultural land in Florida, including 2.5 million acres of cropland, 3 million of pasture land, 1.4 million of rangeland, and 1.5 million of woodland associated with a farm or ranch. So moving to PDR values. For this project, we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the US. This map shows the range of these PVR values across the state, 
the darker the green, the higher the value. The more yellow areas are agricultural land with lower PVR values. The higher the PVR value, the higher the suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. We use these PVR values to identify nationally significant land, and that's another data tab that you can go to. This map shows the nationally significant agricultural land in Florida. You'll see that almost 2 million acres falls into this category, which is about 23% of the state's agricultural land base. About 1.6 million of this is cropland, with the remaining split between pasture, rangeland, and woodland. We are especially concerned about the conversion of highly productive land for both economic and environmental reasons. When land with high PVR values is impacted by development, intensive food production is pushed to more marginal lands. For farmers, that means input costs are typically higher and crop yields are typically lower. It can also lead to more soil erosion and more demand for water for irrigation. So let's go to the last category of conversion. And again, we looked at this period um, from 2001 to 2016, a period of historically low housing starts with a deep recession. We mapped the conversion of agricultural land to two types of land use. The first is highly uh, urban and highly developed land use, or UHD. This includes the traditional culprits in farmland conversion, so expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas largely found in cities and towns, but this category also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites, including oil and well pads and solar panel installations. The second type of conversion is low density residential development, or LDR. This is the first effort of its kind to quantify the extent of large lot housing on the agricultural land base. LDR areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. Conversion in Florida during this period was, was split fairly evenly between urban and highly developed and low density residential land use. 46% was converted to LDR, the remainder to urban and highly developed land. An important point with the LDR land, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no active agriculture on land that we have designated as low density residential land use. There may well be, and some of that small parcel production may be productive and profitable. But we also know that LDR tends to be a transitional land use. Land in Florida that was considered LDR in 2001 was 11 times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. And we know that continued conversion to LDR increases the management challenges for producers who end up farming and ranching in and around non-farm neighbors. Total agricultural land converted over this period was almost 300,000 acres. Pasture land conversion accounted for 125,000 of that, followed by rangeland conversion with 75,500 acres, followed by woodland with 50,400 acres, followed by cropland with 47,500 acres. And lastly, we looked at the quality of the land converted and about 117,000 acres of agricultural land converted was land that was in the upper half of those of Florida's PVR value range. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Billy and Beth to do a little zooming around the map and for some additional perspectives on the findings. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Beth, uh, why don't we start with a spatial summary? All right. So when we're looking at this spatial summary, you'll see that the Gray areas are uh, urban areas, and the red areas are 
areas that have converted to urban high density residential and low density residential over that 15 year period. And this is where we are right now. This is a current look or was a current look in 2016. And you can see the urban areas um, in stark contrast to the PBR soils. And the, the PBR soils really kind of arc up into the panhandle of the state. But what you see here is an illustration of the, what could happen in the future as we have sea level rise. Uh, as we know, Florida is highly urbanized along the coast. And as people move away from the coast in the future, the best farmland in Florida will be under threat as people move inland. Um, and I think it's also interesting to note the, um, how these dark urban areas, the dark maroon and the low density residential areas are sprinkled within the uh, PBR lands. And you can see that specifically around the Lakeland area between Lakeland and Tampa and um, on the, um, the west side uh, as we go down through Highlands County. Um, so I think it's important to note that this is indicative of while Florida scored highly on the planning um, metric on our policies, uh, policy scorecard, but it's about planning for the future of agriculture. How is Florida planning for the future of agriculture? And I'll get into that a little bit later during the presentation. Great, thank you, Billy, and thank you, Beth. Um, so now let's turn to the policy scorecard. Our intention with the scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address the traditional drivers of agricultural land conversion. So that's poorly planned development, weak agricultural viability, and the vulnerability of land when it transfers between generations. And I'm actually gonna stop now because I realize that I forgot um, to talk about this poll, um, which as we're going into talking about policy, is asking you all what you think will be the biggest drivers of agricultural land and conversion over the next 20 years. And the reason we ask this now is as we start to think about Florida's policy response, um, it, that policy response will depend on what people think is going to drive conversion over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and that's why we're asking this question now. You can vote for more than one. And if you're having trouble voting, it might be because you are in full screen mode, in which case you need to go out of that in order to be able to vote. Okay, Beth, what are we, what are we seeing here? So um, just to what Billy's point was of thinking that yes, it's the likelihood of it being continued poorly planned and more housing and commercial and industrial development and the demands on the land base there. But um, as with folks in other states, this generational transfer of ag land is making everybody very concerned. And we know that in Florida, there are six times as many producers producers who are over the age of 65 is under the age of 35. And that suggests a need for sort of more policy action on that front. And then um, as with folks in other states, concern about the viability of agriculture. And we've seen that this has been a particularly challenging time for producers around the US and thinking about that in terms of policy responses. So now, Let's go back to the policy scorecard. And as I said, we're really trying to highlight effective elements of state policies. While AFT has been deeply involved in federal and state agriculture and conservation policy since our founding, this is our first effort at a state policy scorecard. We know that there are many ways that states support agriculture, and this is not an attempt to score them all. There are marketing programs, there are economic development programs. We understand that there are many ways 
there that states invest, including in cooperative extension services. So we did not try to do a full scan of all policy, but focused instead on six different types of policies and programs that tie directly to the land and address one or more of these conversion drivers. So the six policies and programs include purchase of agricultural conservation easement or purchase of development right programs, PDR or PACE. These are voluntary programs that compensate landowners who choose to place a permanent agricultural conservation easement on their property. Here we looked at the Florida Departments of Agriculture's Rural and Family Lands Protection Program. We looked at land use planning and growth management. Um, these planning policies manage growth and stabilize the land base. Most states, including Florida, delegate planning authority to local governments, and planning and zoning decisions are driven largely at the county and municipal level. As Billy will discuss, Local governments must be equipped with a suite of effective tools to support compact development and retain agricultural land. States can play an active and important role here, though, in guiding local planning and supporting local governments with the right tools and incentives to stabilize the agricultural land base. This is what this policy component measures. We looked at property tax relief for agricultural land. Those are programs that reduce property taxes paid on ag land in recognition that working lands require far less in municipal services than do residential uh, than does residential development. Here we looked at Florida's Greenbelt Law. We looked at agricultural district programs. This is not a program that Florida has, but these types of programs encourage landowners to form special areas to support agriculture. Participating farmers in ag districts receive protections and incentives that differ by state. Some states limit annexation in districts while others limit use of eminent domain and offer protections from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure. Some states offer tax incentives for folks in districts and some require district enrollment to participate in their state PACE or PDR program. We looked at two policies and programs that are focused really on addressing that land access uh, challenge and generational transfer, farm link programs. And again, uh, this is not something that Florida has in terms of a state supported program. These types of programs connect farm seekers with farmers and landowners who want their land to stay in agriculture. They can be administered by public or private entities and offer a range of services and resources from online real estate postings to technical assistance, trainings, and educational resources. And then lastly, we looked at state leasing programs. So those that make state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture. Sometimes that's their primary purpose, more often, agricultural use is secondary to generating income for a public purpose or protecting wildlife habitat. So now we're going to scroll down and see how Florida scored relative to other states. You can see it's about median for its PACE program and for its state leasing policies, well above the median for land use planning, and well below the median for property tax relief, and again, those um, no scores for ag districts or farm link. The website allows you to, to dive into the factors behind the scores. So you see, if, Beth, if you scroll down to the select policy or program, which we're going to do, and we're going to start with PACE. And here you can see the components that went into these scores. And Beth, if you would go down to the bottom, it, people can see the factors that were included in each of these scoring. The scores were then weighted. Um, we do have much more information that we are happy to send to people if they want sort of all of what went into the scorecard. But with the with Florida and the PACE program, so it's a uh, rural and family land protection program, you'll see that Florida gets good points for basically the program infrastructure and for requiring that, re that protected land remain in bona fide agricultural production. Where other states score higher is basically on per capita investments in farmland protection. 
Florida's per capita investment in the program through 2017 was 17 cents per person. The six, the six highest scoring states had per capita investments of over a dollar per person. Worth noting here, is the availability of federal matching funds for farmland protection through both the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, that's a USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service Program, as well as NRCS's Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Both provide at least a one-to-one -one match, so are a great deal for taxpayers. The 2018 Farm Bill also eliminated the cash match requirement for the at agricultural conservation easement program. So landowners willing to donate 50% of the value of their easement and who might be eligible for a federal, federal charitable deduction for their donated plot value can participate in ASEP through a land trust or a public PACE program. We hope that the two billion in funding for ASEP and the increased funding for RCPP in the 2018 Farm Bill will help to expand use of these programs in Florida. So moving to land use planning, um, I think as Billy said, Florida, Florida scores well in land use planning. And as Billy said, it scores high on planning, but not necessarily planning for the future of agriculture. High scoring states in this category have created state plans for agriculture. Some have developed specific goals related to agricultural land retention and protection, and then require consistency between those state goals and local plans. Some states provide support or incentives to local governments to develop farmland protection plans and strategies. So turning to property tax relief, the Greenbelt Law and Agricultural Classification gets a fairly low score across the board, um, in part because it does not impose withdrawal penalties, and in part because it we have a zero next to these acres enrolled. Um, it may be that Florida tracks statewide enrollment in agricultural land classification and we were simply unable to get the information. Um, if it does not track that enrollment though, that's something that the state may want to do. And then lastly, let's look at state leasing. So again, here Florida seems to have a good process in place for leasing state-owned land. And we understand that as of 2019, multiple agencies in Florida lease approximately 14,200 acres of agricultural land. Where other states have scored higher is in having a comprehensive inventory of that state-owned land that could be made available for farming and not just from natural resources agencies, but from any type of state-owned land. Um, we feel that this is an especially important mechanism for identifying new land access opportunities, especially smaller plot parcels in and near urban areas. And just again, in, in sort of closing this out and thinking about the importance of both the idea of state leasing and how do you use that as an opportunity for new land access for next generation farmers and that importance of farm linking, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a statewide state supported program that provides for some of that listing, linking and matching or is administered by one or more nonprofits to which the state um, provides some type of support. I don't think that AFT has a strong preference of those. It's just from our perspective, having that kind of service available statewide to farmers and landowners is particularly important to address generational transfer. So, um, I hope that that was a helpful cruise through the findings. If you have questions, please do write them in now. And as we go out of the website, we're going to launch a poll which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to 
focus on for Florida. And my apologies, we could only have five. I realized we should have taken out the not sure, need more information, but it's now we can't. Um, so if you think that those state leasing or farm link are amongst the top priorities, please feel free to write those in. Okay, Beth. All right, this is very helpful. Um, and again, sort of focus, continued focus on the need for um, improvements or funding expansion for PACE is clearly at the top of the list. Um, interesting to see the property tax relief and I think sort of ways that that program could be more um, synergistic both with uh, the PACE program and with land use planning is a is a good way to think about that. Um, the National Agricultural Land Network will be hosting a series of policy webinars beginning in the early fall which we hope will be a way for those of you who want to learn more about some of these specific policy elements. So we're gonna dive deep into each one of these, plus the other two that weren't on this list, um, about what really makes for effective programming in this area. And so we hope that people who are interested will find that useful. So going back out to our, back to our PowerPoint, one thing missing from our spatial analysis is protected agricultural land. That's because there is not a national comprehensive data layer focused on protected agricultural land specifically. We are building this new database now. Um, it's good to see that there's a lot of green dots here in Florida already. But if you have not heard from us and you are an entity or an agency that holds agricultural conservation easements, please let us know that by adding a comment in the question panel. That way we will be back in touch with you and can be sure that any easements that you hold are included in our database. So now we're gonna stop and take questions. So Chris, I'm looking here and I don't see any questions yet. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and if you can't think of them now, we certainly uh, want you to feel free to enter those as we continue through the presentation. So having said that, I will proceed on to the next slide. Great. And I think it's important to note that time is not on our side in saving our farm and ranch land, which is why AFT just announced a bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. We know that to get to this goal, we will need to lock arms with as many partners and practitioners on this call and others around the United States who are deeply concerned about saving the land that sustains us. So here are some of the ways that AFT will be strengthening its commitment to farmland protection across the country and the South especially. We've talked about establishing the National Agricultural Land Network, providing new leadership in key locations. AFT will be expanding its footprint with a commitment of, of staff and um, offices in the Southeast in the coming year or so. Uh, protecting more farmland ourselves and with partners. Um, I think it's important to note here that American Farmland Trust is a land trust. We do hold conservation easements, but 
typically we don't hold easements in areas with viable land trust or farmland protection entities in place. We helped create many of those entities and programs over the last 40 years and we would not want to create redundancy. So we're, AFT as a land trust is interested in holding uh, new conservation in areas where there aren't current partners in place. Uh, advocating for stronger state and federal policies. We want you to use this information to uh, change uh, policies in across Florida. We are happy to help you do that, to provide information. And in, in many cases, um, I'll be available to meet with state legislators. Um, that is part of my strategy uh, in our coming fiscal year which begins on October 1. So I certainly am open to, to do that. And promoting research-based decision-making in the planning process, which um, we talked earlier about um, planning for the future of agriculture. And that really takes us to our next slide here um, as we move forward. So what more can Florida do? analyzing and mapping agricultural land trends and conditions. I've met with uh, many partners across Florida over the last several years, many of whom who are on this call, and uh, there are a lot of resources there, but please use this data. Please go to our microsite and use this data for Florida to affect change um, for farmland for the future. Strengthening or adopting a coordinated suite of policies. And Chris mentioned this earlier. What we're talking about here is not just planning, but planning for the future of agriculture. And the suite of policies that we're recommending consist of urban growth boundaries, large lot minimums in rural areas, agricultural zoning, and farmland protection programs that are part of the overall comprehensive planning process. And your comprehensive planning process in each county, there should be a goal of protected farmland so that the comprehensive planning process moves you toward that goal uh, and helps in having a goal out there is the way to protect farmland. So you can use these suite of policies and programs to uh, reach your goal for farmland protection. The large, the low density residential development is critically important. And what we're talking about here are the smaller uh, farmettes, the McMansions, the, um, the five acre lots, the 10 acre lots, uh, the 15 acre lots, the 20 acre lots um, that are, that fragment um, critical masses of protected farmland or agricultural areas. And, they, as you can see by the maps that we looked at, they multiply over time and they grow and they become urbanized. Uh, supporting farm viability and access to land. Planning for agriculture and not, not just around it. Planning for the future of agriculture. That's what we're talking about here. Conserving land with permanent conservation easements is the ideal. Uh, planning and zoning is subject to change. Um, planning and zoning is a political process. Uh, so once a strong uh, planning process that incorporates planning for the future of agriculture, as well as planning for other non-agricultural economic development um, in a very um, concerted manner, uh, each on a parallel track is the way to go. So it's not a win-lose proposition but it's how do we conserve the land that we need for this major economic driver in Florida. And then saving the best, but not forgetting the rest. So the PVR land, the productive, versatile and resilient land is that's what we want to save now and your nationally significant soils, but your more marginal soils, um, and soils that aren't suitable farming can be planned properly, for example, for solar. AFT has a great um, solar siting program, and if you're interested, we can share that information with you. So at this point of the presentation, 
I will turn it back over to Chris. Great. Um, thank you, Billy. And again, if folks have questions, please feel free. Um, here's one actually I have for you, Billy, and that is when I look back at the poll findings and see that there was a a significant number of folks who think that climate change is going to be a driver of conversion. And so my question for you is thinking about climate, how how do people make the case between climate change and uh, agricultural land conversion and that that is a threat um, to continued climate? And Or let me phrase it in a different way. How do folks make the case that agricultural land um, retention and protection can help to mitigate against climate change? Sure. Uh, so I think it's a two-part answer. First, I'll say that um, planning for what's going to happen when you live in a coastal state is a reality that we're going to have to face. Um, saltwater intrusion, uh, rising, um, you know, having um, higher sea levels. Uh, people are going to begin moving away from the coast. That's going to put greater pressure inland on your best soils. And it's not just unique to Florida. These are in all the coastal states. So planning in such a way that as, as that trend goes forward in the future, that you're saving your best soils while also planning appropriately for housing and for businesses and other non-agricultural uses at the same time. Um, planning for the future of agriculture, and I mentioned this a minute ago, so that you're not putting solar panels on your best farmland. That's, that's very straightforward. On the conserving as a way to mitigate climate change, um, American Farmland Trust has a national climate initiative and um, we, our national climate director is doing research about uh, sinking carbon in farmland. So we can sink carbon in farmland with sound farming practices, with regenerative agriculture and um, I don't want to go into that whole subject on this call today, but farmland protection, smart farming practices, regenerative agricultures, that's the way to that we can sink more carbon to address and mitigate climate change in this country. And um, if you go to farmland.org, our website, and you can type in climate in the search field, and there's quite a bit of information there about that. The other thing I'll talk about now, Chris, as I'm mindful of our time, is cost of community services study. So American Farmland Trust has done over 83, uh, over 80 cost of community services studies across the nation. And what those studies show is that sprawl uses more in services than it pays in taxes and that ag uses less in services than it pays in taxes and your core urban areas are using even less. So even though ag and your core urban uses are creating a net gain on the tax dollar, sprawl is using more than that gain. So sprawl is ag and your core urban areas are subsidizing sprawl, but it's still not enough to pay for all the services that sprawl is using. And AFT has done these studies across the nation. Uh, you can find those on AFT's um, uh, data clearinghouse website, which is farmlandinfo.org. And you can search by state, but for this subject, you can just simply in the search field, enter cost of community services, and uh, scroll down and you'll see um, an explanation of that whole um, methodology. But it's, it's so true. Uh, sprawl uses more in services than it pays in taxes. The other thing that you have, as you have non-contiguous uh, sprawl development in agricultural areas, is that those tend to also be a proliferation of septic tank development 
which has its own impacts, um, as you can imagine. So those are some very high level points about planning for the future of agriculture. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but if not, I'll turn it back over to Chris. Great, thank you, Billy. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about resources that are available through American Farmland Trust. But before I do that, because what helps us with both of these um, resources that we provide is to get a sense from folks as to what information and what type of technical assistance they feel would be most helpful in addressing agricultural land conversion. So if you would be willing to do this last poll for us, it helps us to tailor going forward the type of programming that we provide both through the network that I'm gonna talk about and through our Farmland Information Center. So again, you can vote for more than one. If there's some other type of training or information you think would be particularly relevant, um, please feel free to write that in as well. Okay, well, this is again very useful. Thank you for doing that. Um, uh, continued focus and information around easements, around state and local policy tools, and land use planning tools. Um, all of these are ones that we are planning to focus on. So, with that, let, let's go back and let me talk um, for a minute about both of these resources. So the Farmland Information Center is, as Billy mentioned, a data clearinghouse. It is its own website, so farmlandinfo.org, and it is a repository of a huge amount of information um, that can help make the case for stabilizing and protecting the agricultural land base. So we run the gamut from the cost of community services studies, two studies that talk about the economic impact of agricultural of agriculture generally, but the economic impact of PACE programs. And we have, again, a number of our studies. We have studies from um, other researchers and academic institutions. Um, there are a couple of but you can find the research that we have done around how retaining the agricultural base is good on the climate front. These are our greener fields reports um, from California and New York. But we also have a, a large number of statistics. We have state policies. We have a vast number of other tools. There is a farmland protection directory and through our Farmland Information Center, Center we do uh, um, annual surveys of state PACE programs. So you can find out more there, how your state compares to others. We do a county and local PACE program survey. We do a survey of land trusts who focus specifically on agricultural land protection. Um, and uh, we are in the process of vastly expanding the information available about the agricultural conservation easement program. These are both all the forms that entities need to uh, apply to the program, plus a particular fact sheet for landowners who might be interested in the program and a wealth of other resources. There is also a telephone number and people do actually answer the phone and if it's a message they do return the call so know that you can just pick up the phone and call if you have a particular question about how do you find something how do you find a state policy how do you find a particular statistic so know that that information is available for you free of charge um, and i hope that i said that that was a collaboration with usda's natural resource conservation service um, 
which it has been for decades. Turning now to the National Agricultural Land Network, this is a newly launched network that our intent with it is to build the collective capacity of practitioners, both on the permanent ag land protection side, but those who are involved in thinking about just protect, retaining the agricultural land base. So those involved in land use planning and those types of thinking about planning for the future of the agricultural land base. It is a membership based, but um, the membership is free. Um, it is not an advocacy entity so that public agencies can join and we would welcome and encourage you if you are a state or a county agency to join up. We really intend this to be peer networking and information sharing. We will be having a range of conversations, some of which are focused on the basic tools around land use planning and how do you write a good agricultural conservation easement, but we are gonna focus as well as what are those new tools that we are gonna collectively need to make the case for agriculture protection? What are those um, ways that we can be combining thinking about agricultural land protection and providing new land access opportunities for farmers? How do we work with farmers and ranchers with permanently protected land on encouraging additional conservation on the land that makes sense for those farmers and ranchers? What are ways to incentivize that? So we hope that people will find this useful. We are gonna start with these policy webinars, but we are going to have specific regional conversations around the use of ASEP and particularly the agricultural lands easement port of part of that um, uh, program and around the regional conservation partnership program. So I hope that people will join us. You can sign up by going to farmland.org backslash N-A-L-N. And if you have any questions, please do call, uh, call me or email me. And lastly, let me just point out that that farmland.org farms under threat is how you get directly to the interactive website. And I hope people will make use of that again, because it is um, a pretty cool new feature with a lot of different types of information. With that, Billy, let me um, end and hand it back to you. Thanks, Chris. I wanna thank all of the partners and supporters and farmers across Florida who have joined us today. Um, we are looking forward to working with all of you in the future. And uh, I wanna give my email address, which is bvanpelt at farmland.org. That's bvanpelt at farmland.org. I can also be found on AFT's website at farmland.org. Um, and you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to answer questions, happy to send you information and to provide assistance however I can. Um, and just look forward to working with you again in the future. So turning it back to Chris now. Great. So with that, um, thank you all again for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of the afternoon and a good weekend. Take care.